this is grow your own. I was I wanted to do more of like a pot growing theme, which was kind of one of the ways I got into this uh, career. Um, uh, my name is Jody. I'm the CTO and co-founder of ZivTech, which is in Philadelphia. We started in 2008, and um, we're up to 30 or 35. I'm looking weirdly number blind. Uh, people now, and uh, it's been a long and uh, fun and difficult road. So I wanted to do this talk because I hear people all the time saying that there's not enough talent, that they can't find the, the developers and the designers and mostly the technical people that they need, but also the like project managers and all kinds of talent that they can't find. And I just feel like it's a little entitled uh, that you would be in this world where there should just be there should just be these people that you can just hire and for a decent price and that they would already know all the skills that you really needed them to know and just, just come in, hit the ground running. And um, then they would just make you a bunch of money. You wouldn't really have any problems with them. You wouldn't really have to do much for them other than feed them some pizza and, and pay them and that everything would be fine. And so when people can't find that, then they get upset and they say, there's not enough talent. There, people aren't, uh, they're not getting educated right. They, we don't have the right people out there. We don't have the right programs out there. Um, to me, I think the world is full of talent, right? Um, no, they haven't learned the specific things that you need them to do at your job yet. Uh, but there's so many intelligent people out there that uh, you know would love to have a good career if you would help them out. So um, when I started working in Drupal, I saw myself as someone who made websites, right? And that was my output. I was making websites or I was making code. But you know, over the years, now I see that what I'm really, my product is, is people. Right, so I'm selling, you know, as as having a bunch of employees, I'm selling their time and their expertise and their knowledge and their human capacity. Nobody cares about the code, how much the code is worth. It's GPL anyway, right? We we say that we're going to reuse it on the next project, and we never do, right? It's like sort of like, who cares about the code when you have the coder? It's like it's like the egg and the chicken, like. You, gotta, you have to take care of the chicken, not each little egg. They just keep on making more. So I started to realize that me sitting there being such a great website maker wasn't really that valuable. And what was really valuable was me being able to um, grow more people who could do this, right? Because then I could really scale up. Um, you're only going to do so well as one person doing this, but if you are able to grow more and more people that can also do it. Now, not only is your business doing better, but you start to realize that actually this is more important than building the websites in terms of your values. So this is just like an awkward um, family photo from work one day when we got our hoodies. And I guess I just started to realize that over the years that I really don't care about websites or Drupal or open source or technology. I guess I could, I'm really good at listing things I don't care about because I'm pretty depressed, so it's sort of like my superpower to uh, not care about things. It's like, only I, all I really care about is Game of Thrones and my cat. But, <laughs> but what, I, no, what I meant to say that I really care about is the, is the people. Okay, ultimately it's like, I don't care about the Drupal Kool-Aid and, and any of this other stuff. The only thing that really matters are people, right? So, and, and then having this, 
this company where I have these people over over many years and I see them get married and have children and um, buy houses and and ha and enjoy their lives and enjoy their coworkers and have a an office that they enjoy uh, and know that that we were a part of that that they wouldn't have had everything that that they needed in their life um, without us and that they also you know created our value you know it's it's a it's a much better feeling than uh than just fixing a bug on a website. So we, so we early on uh, adopted this idea that we were going to train up our people and that we weren't going to just expect them to come in all ready to go. We were gonna bring people in at all different levels including having no experience at all, like just like basic computing skills, like no um, programming of any sort. And over the years, we we found that we gained a lot from doing that. So we have, I think, uh, much better retention than than most of our peers. I have a lot of people that have been there almost since the start. I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of developers that have been there seven years, and. Even and they have a lot of loyalty and they enjoy being there. And even the ones that have left, I get to see them in events like this, and you know that they, they still are on our side. And a lot of times people leave because they they're um, they have to move for their significant other or something like that. Also, the team is very close, communicates very well. Um, when you think of like a team as a set of individuals, almost like they're neurons in your brain, the more connections that they have and the better they communicate, the stronger the team. So you could have a team of like a whole bunch of really great developers, but if they don't communicate well, it's not nearly as effective, right? So if, but if your team was, some of them were really strong or maybe they're all different strengths in all different ways, but they communicate really well that can actually be much stronger than a group of individuals that are each very strong themselves. I'm not gonna do any uh, sports metaphors, but you can imagine your own metaphors there. Um, also, they're very harmonious because they've all been trained uh, in the same way. So they don't have like strong, we don't have a lot of strong um, conflicts of how we do things. We don't have one person saying, we should only use Vim, and this guy's on Emacs, and this woman thinks we should use panels for everything, and this one thinks it should all be display suite, and they're all constantly fighting, and every project is done in a different way. All of our projects are kind of done in the same way because we're all trained by the same people, and we all, um, most of us, trained from scratch, basically, so we're not like undoing old opinions, really. And we also have a lot of um, generosity towards the towards each other on the team um, because people give you this retention, this loyalty, and this generosity because you gave them something. You took a chance on them when they didn't have um, a lot of opportunities and you invested a lot in them and people feel that. We also have a lot of developers who have other strengths. Um, so they're more well-rounded. So, so if we have, um, if we have, as this is not just about developers, but mainly because that's my background. But, but say we have someone come in uh, to do a Spanish-speaking magazine. Well, we have three people that speak Spanish, and we have um, six musicians, and we have, you know. All, all types of very well-rounded people because we didn't just grab the people who were obsessed with only development and didn't have really any other sides to them. We have all types of people. And best of all, I think we have this culture of training this, this where everyone um, values the idea of, of working together to teach each other and then that extends not just to um, 
our own team, but to how we interact with our clients. And ultimately, I find that, that clients, um, in many cases, they value being taught more than they value the end product of like whatever the website or the code is that you're doing. So when I have this whole team of people who, who know how to communicate and know that teaching is, is the highest value, they're every day, whether they're the project manager, or the developer, or the QA person, or anyone else, they're always finding that chance to teach the client something, which um, is really excellent for our clients. So the way we got started with this whole idea was, was really from necessity, um, as well as from personal values. So um, I uh, had a, a few different careers before I got into this, because I'm pretty old. Um, the, I was actually a, a chemist, and I was also a math teacher for a little bit. And I, but then before that, I had lots of really awful jobs. Well, even even those jobs were pretty awful. Like being a chemist, it was like I would use my brain like maybe once a week for like two seconds, and then the rest of the time I would just be pouring things. Um, and I never had anyone who could, I never worked at a place where anyone really recognized my talent. I I had jobs. I was a I was a telemarketer. I was. Um, data entry, uh, I did all kinds of stupid jobs, and I was a pretty bright person. And nobody could seem to notice, you know, that maybe there was something more they should be having me do. And so I always thought that was really a, a shame that we had this economy where there were such talented people in it that were being so wasted and not really being given any opportunities. And I always thought that, you know, I wish that someone would uh, have given me an opportunity to do something um, at my level. But instead of that happening, I made it happen for myself and started this company in 2008. Um, but of course, we didn't have any money. And so, and even, and back then there were even fewer Drupal developers around, and I'm super picky. I don't like um, people that that say that they're that they're a great developer, and then they are just a hacker and do all kinds of nasty stuff. I couldn't have any kind of bad work coming out of my company, and and of course we started in 2008, and then we and then we hired a few people, then the economy collapsed, and all of our work went away. And um, we decided that we weren't going to fire anyone. Well, it was tough anyway because we hired like four or five people and they didn't really have any experience. So I was doing all of the billable work plus teaching uh, these people. Then the work went away, so we decided to just pay them from our credit cards. Um, and those about half of those people are still with us and they're and they're doing great. I'm really glad that we kept them. But the main reason that we that we started hiring people that that didn't really have much or any experience was we couldn't afford uh, anyone that did. And there really weren't any. We really um, we we don't, we're not a virtual company. We've always had an office. So we're limited to our local area and there really was very few, um, the people that we could find that, that were good Drupal developers, we did hire, but there are very few people. So what we did was we, uh, always, we would just bring everyone into the office and make sure everyone communicates, and we would bring um, a willingness to teach. Now that was always a, that, I go back and forth with having problems with that because I think I am a good teacher, but I'm also an autodidact. So that makes me have a little chip on my shoulder where I think, I think probably a lot of us are like that. Where we're like, well, no one taught me. Can't these people just learn on their own like I did? What's wrong with them? Because I did it and they should too. Well, you can't expect everyone to, uh, to be like you in this world, right? 
And if you can get past that and give them, a, give them some empathy, and if you believe that, that people are basic, that the people you have are basically intelligent and that you can teach them something and they can learn, they might not learn as quickly as you would like sometimes, um, but if you believe that they will learn, and, you've, and I've seen it, um, I've had many times where I've thought, this person will never learn. This person just is not getting it. I have to cut my losses with this person. And then you look a couple years later, and, and they're doing so well. Um, some people just take a little bit longer than others. So over the years, we've found a lot of uh, on-ramps, because obviously one of the challenges when you bring in really green people is how to get them to bill any hours at all in order to uh, be able to afford paying them. So, so they can, when you have a green person, not only are they not billing very many hours, but they're also taking a lot of time from people who would be billing a lot of hours. And so you're constantly having this feeling of like, oh God, like I should, I don't have time to help you. I have to get my work done. Um, and you have to fight that and say, you know what? Helping you is more important than getting my work done. Getting my work done is um, a short term money. Teaching someone um, is long term, right? Uh, you have to find the balance, obviously, because you have to keep the, the money coming in. But everyone on your team has to understand that, that training the people up is the highest priority. It's not just a distraction um, slowing you down from getting your work done. It is the whole future of the company. Uh, and that that is a, a valuable activity that you have to, um, you have to work against your impulse to be always efficient because you're always trying to be efficient about yourself. But when it's a team, it's not just about being efficient for yourself. So we found a lot of different ways that we can have them build and learn. Um, as they're, you know, getting experience. So one way is QA. So having them do testing gets them in the mix of the whole project. You know, they're, they're moving through the tickets, they're testing everything, they're passing things up to the client. And that was, but that was a tough one for a long time because in order to really do QA on our projects, you'd have to do them on the development site and sometimes things weren't deployed properly and all these problems. So that's kind of how we got into this whole other businesses, Probo, um, CI, which really helps to make it more accessible for us to have QA people that don't have a lot of experience and can really just see what's going on with uh, each ticket in process. Documentation is another thing that we have people work on that have less experience. We're lucky enough to have a client that now comes to us just for technical documentation. And writing technical documentation is something that a smart, generally logical, technical, college-educated person can do without, you know, five years of development experience. And they, in the process, are learning more about uh, this kind of software. Site building, that's one of the great things about Drupal, is that you can start people off and they can learn site building pretty quickly. Of course, it's kind of annoying how long it takes them to learn features, but hopefully that'll be dead soon. Um, and you know, it takes them a while to learn Git, um, command line, stuff like that. But but the fact that they can you know make views and content types and do the general Drupal site building pretty quickly lets them have this on ramp that they can do stuff like that for a year or two while they're starting to learn their development chops. And even better the senior developers don't really like to do all that site building anyway. So it's nice to have those people on your team um, that you can work with. Um, we also have them, similar to documentation, we have them making training materials. So they'll make training materials for clients like as, uh, like training videos or, or, um, or manuals similar to documentation. And they'll also make it for, um, we do paid trainings. Um, like we did two trainings for DrupalCon, we have like these big training manuals, we have them write, edit, um, take those materials, learn from the materials while they edit the materials. We have them writing like BHAT tests, 
you don't have to uh, be able to write code to, to um, write a lot of those BHAT tests. You get a lot more in the mix of the software development project. And we, then we can have them on like first level support where at least they can try, if they can't figure out how to fix the problem, at least they can try to reproduce it and then rewrite the problem in like a way that the developers could actually understand it. So there's lots of things that you can find for, um, for greener people to work on. Then we have the problem of if we have all of these brand new people, how do we make sure that our quality stays high in our work? So I am very obsessed with quality, so I never wanted to have a situation, sort of my worst nightmare, where bad quality work is going out to our clients. And so it can be a little bit scary bringing in all these new people. Um, so what we, we solved that really with just process. I mean, I really think quality is just all about process. So our process includes the we work in now and feature branches and pull requests and then and then a um, more senior developer always does code review. Even if you're pushing like a features module or something or some little change like that or some CSS or something, the every, every single change that you're making goes through code review. And it doesn't even get merged until this the review and the QA has happened. So they're safe to screw up as much as they want. It's not going anywhere. They're not introducing any security problems, performance problems. They're just sending it to me for me to give them feedback. But the great thing about that is a lot of the times, especially at the beginning, I didn't have any type of um, plan, really, for how I was training my people. And many of them got trained up just from code review, you know? <laughs> so like that process has, has multiple um, advantages. Like not only does it keep up your quality, but it creates this feedback loop where people are getting a uh, review on every single thing they're doing every day and then they learn pretty quickly to not make the same mistake again and again um, so, so they can get their work past me. We also handle having um, all of these different people at different levels by working with different uh, billing levels which I don't necessarily recommend. It's been like a huge headache in terms of um, billing all throughout the years that we have all of these different rates that we charge people at. The idea being that if we charge a more junior person like half as much money an hour, then the clients shouldn't um, object to having that person on the project because yeah, the person might take longer, but they're, you're paying a lot less. Uh, we also do discount a lot of junior work. We would rather have them work on a real project and then us discount the time than to keep them away from the project because we don't think that they can do it in the right amount of time. So we deal with that by when we do estimates for each sprint, we put the hour estimate on each ticket so that they have an idea of how long we expected it to take and then if they blow it way up, like it was a two hour ticket and then they end up putting 15 hours on it, we just discount it back down to two hours. Um, and sort of expected that that happens. So we really have varied with how formally we've tried to train people over the years. Um, and different people have different approaches. A couple years ago, summer of 2014, we did a we did our own developer boot camp, uh, which was we got a grant from the city to to make this free boot camp, which I really liked. I don't like th these paid boot camps. I really loved that it was free, and um, but it ended up costing us a lot of money because it cost us more than the grant was for, and it took up like my entire summer. So it was pretty tough. But it was really interesting how the people who applied for the, the boot camp were so much more diverse than the people who apply for tech jobs. We didn't try to have a bunch of women and a bunch of minorities in our boot camp. It was just a very diverse like application pool. And they were mostly all fairly recent college grads. Some of them were still in college who um, didn't have any tech backgrounds. Some of them were science majors, some of them were um, humanities majors. 
And I guess that a lot of them maybe were starting to see the writing on the wall and start to think like, uh, I guess there is no job in the uh, field that I just paid a hundred grand for. And maybe I should, you know. So, so it was like a six week course. They had very little background. It was just amazing to see how well they worked and start to see how some of them, you know, were going to be more back end and some more front end and some maybe would be a better project manager. Um, all different skills. But I really enjoyed that and we hired some people from that, which was another of our um, alternate reasons for doing it. No, I definitely recommend doing something like that if you can. I, I don't think I can afford the, the time to do another one of those soon, but I would try to do something on a smaller scale where uh, maybe like once a week have a free class uh, where people could come because there's no better way to see how good a potential hire is than to actually train them and work with them over a period of time. You'll find out who's reliable, who learns quickly, who communicates well. And then you can just hire the star students. And the others, I helped a lot of them get jobs in the, uh, at other companies. This is another way we've gone about uh, training someone. This, this guy, John, he's very um, self-directed. And so he helped to make this himself where he has this whole list of different things that he realizes that he needs to learn and then he puts in like what he needs to learn and where he's at with it and, and ranks it and we can follow up with it. So that was a nice approach. I, I really just think different, um, I like to treat everyone as an individual, I guess. And, and, the, and I don't like to like shove everybody into like one training program. Um, I like to see how it shakes out and start them with little structure and then if they seem, if that's not working, then work with them, you know, to get a structure that works for them. Um, there's a, there's a lot of, I think that overall that, that what people are talking about in the Drupal community is the apprenticeship model. And I've read from a few other companies, I'm sure a lot more are doing it than I have here, how they're handling this. Uh, but yeah, it really is a matter of that this is like a, a trade, what we do. And you need to go through an apprenticeship to really be good. And you'll see people who, who are, really, um, are really intelligent and really hardworking, and they're, but they don't work on, with a high level team. They just don't, they just don't learn and grow as fast as when you're with a team. Like I really think it's about, the best way to, to learn this stuff is to be embedded with a team um, and, and really um, shadow people and, and see how they're doing it. So these different apprenticeship models, um, the metal toad one was interesting, it was like you, there's some classwork for a while and then you are like an intern and then you move up a level. All that stuff to me, I'm, a, I'm very on the side of um, just deal with things as they happen and um, not like make formal structures, but they're very interesting programs. So, so yeah, the way I really like to do things, probably because I'm just lazy, I don't like to plan things. I really believe in like teachable moments. So, so just like when someone asks you a question, making time to answer. It's very simple. <laughs> it's a simple uh, approach, right? So, t so instead of saying that like, oh, that question that they're asking me right now, I'm too busy for it and they're distracting me. No, there's something about the fact that they're asking it to you right now that makes it special. You don't, might not know what it is yet, that makes it special, but it's exactly what they need to know right now. Um, and they're asking it for to you for a reason, and it might not make sense to you, but if you just make time for your people, uh, which is hard, it's hard to make time for your people when you're a leader. It's like, you know, people are going from meeting to meeting to meeting, and everyone's running up on you, and there's a thousand emails, but I just have to tell myself, like, you know, none of that is as important as 
what someone's asking me right now to talk, you know, not, they're not always asking me um, to teach them how to use their virtual machine. You know, sometimes they're asking me how to deal with a client or sometimes they're asking me um, just to, just to talk to them about their personal life or something, right? But whatever it is, it's what they need um, and to just get past how busy you are and and to take care of those people. I mean, that's, that's why I really liked this gardening metaphor is like you have to, you know, you have to put time and love into it. You know, it takes time. You can't just like think it's going to speed things up and get frustrated at, at, you know, how fast your plants are growing. You know, you have to wait. You have to give them what they need, not overwhelm them, but you don't want to baby them either. You know, you want them to be hardy. You don't want to feed them pizza. You want to feed them, you know, I don't know, sandwiches. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I really believe in uh, mentor-driven development, which is where you you care more about the the mentorship is sort of comes first, um, and the development follows, right? So so not only is it a matter of mentoring the the new people, but the most important thing that I need my people to learn is not how to use Drupal or, or be a great developer. The most important thing for them to learn is, is, to, is to value the same thing, is to value training people. Because when they value training people, now they can train more people, right? <laughs> so if all they do is, is learn to be like a great Drupal developer, well, I'm getting some value out of them. But if, but if they learn to be a great Drupal developer and to teach everyone around them and to grow up the next generation that we hire, that's giving me a lot more value from them, right? So that's like the main thing um, that I want them to learn is, is how to teach. So, but luckily, um, you know, like the Feinstein method, like luckily teaching is a really great way to learn. So when you, when you shove someone into this teaching position, which I do to them all the time. I'll have someone who's there for a month and I'll tell them that they have to teach the new person how to do something. They say, ah, I don't know how to do it. I'm like, well, I think you do, you know? And um, they, it does, it teaches them a lot. When they know that they have to, that they're gonna have to teach someone else, they really learn it. Not only that, but they can also document what they're learning and create training materials. Now it really depends on the person. Some people you could tell them to document things and they're never going to do it, especially if they're ADD, I find. They, ADD people to me seem like they don't, um, that they d tend to procrastinate on writing assignments. Uh, but some people are really great at writing documentation and so they can do that as they learn and like pave the way for the next people. As long as they understand that that's the model, right? Okay, so that's the model of the whole company. That's how we work: is we, is we teach and we learn, and then teach and we learn, right? And that's the whole way it works. So, so that's what really makes it sustainable. So that's what I I've really, am enjoying now is that you know at first it was just like me teaching everyone, and now I can just kind of look back and it's just like a room full of people talking and teaching each other. And a lot of that is cultural, like there's, um, that they're open to ask for help and that they're open to say, well, I'm not really sure, but I think you can try, you know, there's not a lot of like ego of, um, of um, people, uh, you know, trying to prove that they don't need help, uh, which I think is a, a real, a huge problem. Like I wouldn't, tolerate anyone on my team like that because it would make everyone afraid uh, to to be able to work together. So as a leader, I really see teaching as the most, the highest ROI activity that I can be doing. It's not a, it's not a distraction away from anything. It, it has to be you know, you only do what you prioritize, you know. So you have to you have to see it as 
as your priority to to make that time to teach people. Um, and if it's not, if it's your third or fourth or fifth priority, it's not going to happen. You know, it's got to be your top your top priority. And you have to make it obvious that you are encouraging and praising that in your team. Um, you know, just to recognize like, hey, I really like how you guys are working together. You know, I like that you're taking time to teach that person. Um, and, um, you know, letting people learn in different ways. I don't like to like formally assign people like, oh, this is gonna be your mentor. You have to work with this person and you have to learn this um, and you have to watch these Drupal Eyes Me videos. Um, that can work for some people, but um, everyone kind of learns in different ways. So if you kind of, if you give them encouragement and, um, and you support them and talk to them about how it's going and um, kind of let them find their own way. And that includes that you have to let people be individuals, which means they're not coming in and then you're gonna grow them to be just like you, right? No one's going to be just like you. You're going to have to see, you're really gonna have to find their strengths and how to play to their strengths. Um, and that's what I really see a lot of my job as CTO is, is that I have to know my people really well and then, and then put them in the right places to succeed, right? Because they're all so different and there's, there, I don't want them to all just be writing Drupal code. They're all Drupal developers. Like they all have all these different strengths and then all of a sudden I had this, um, we had a designer we thought she was pretty shy. Then we realized she had, um, she's a great public speaker. We had no idea, because she seemed so shy. Uh, now she's doing trainings, so that's her job, right? Um, she enjoys that. So it's like, there's a, there's a lot more to, there's a lot m more ways to run these businesses than just writing Drupal code, right? So we have, we've grown in all different directions, partly because of the needs of our clients and partly because of the strengths of our team. It's so like we've had, um, we've grown into QA, documentation, marketing, writing, um, support, training, um, design, you know, all different directions as we have like different people's strengths. Um, someone might come in and they, they want to learn a different language or they know a different programming language and then you start doing more work in that direction. I just think that instead of you know telling people what to do and then getting the value from them you want to tell them more like what direction what your values are in general and then let them figure out how they fit in there because people have a lot more value than you might realize they do right if you just try to tell them what their value is um, it's just this one thing but you have to believe that people can be very valuable, extremely valuable, and that if you support them and you make them feel like they want to be on your side because you support them, and then they'll, they'll give their all instead of, instead of them just giving you what you specifically asked for, which will never be as much as what they really have, because you could never guess uh, what they can really offer. So a few things to avoid if you go in this direction. Um, divas are like the senior developers who are like, you know, they don't want to do anything that's beneath them and they're rude and they're condescending. And the lone wolves who might be like, you know, great developers, but they just don't know how to communicate, don't want to communicate. I don't think they're very valuable. I think that they're they know their stuff and a lot of times people keep them because they're afraid to get rid of them. Oh, this guy like runs all of our infrastructure. We can't ever get rid of him. Um, but they're so toxic to your culture that I don't think it's really worth it. Unpaid interns, um, it's not good to not pay people. It's wrong. I mean, it, it, what kind of message does it send to that person or to the rest of your team that you're just willing to just take advantage of a desperate person just because you can? Uh, it's not, if you, if you show them instead, hey, 
I'm willing to help you um, because I believe in you, they'll show you that you were right to believe in them. If you show them, hey, I'm not really going to take any risk on you. Uh, you're going to take all the risk. And um, and I'm going to just like let you go after six weeks because that's the length of the internship. And that way I'll just see if you happen to be incredibly awesome really, really quickly, then I'll keep you. Otherwise, I'll kick you out to the street um, because I'm not willing to invest in you in the long haul. And so you shouldn't really be willing to do so with me either. Contractors, I have so I have the best contractor right here. Uh, I have another contractor too, but contractors work out for us when they're when they're really top level. Um, but in general, we try to have everyone full time employed at the office because that's where we can really best uh, teach and learn. And I know everyone's very like go virtual office these days, but it's almost like they're protesting too hard, you know? Like, if it's really that great, why do they keep talking about it? I don't know. Um, so, you know, I like everyone in the office because I just don't think that you, especially a very junior person, they need someone, like, sitting next to them, like, looking at their screen, talking to them. Like, um, you can do a lot of that online, but it's just not the same. And a lot of what I do is I just overhear people I just overhear their conversations and I, you know, go help them. And and so you can't kind of have that same feeling remotely. And cutbacks. So we've had lots of um, ups and downs economically, but what we've never done is is cut back. You know, maybe maybe uh, that's a little uh, been masochistic at times, but. I just feel that you, you invest in these people. If you're going to cut them now because sales were bad and business is slow, you're just throwing away everything that you've, that you've invested in. It's like you, you've grown it and grown it and grown it, and, it, and it's just starting to, to bear fruit, and now you're just going to throw it out. I, I always say like I would rather beg, borrow, and steal before I would cut uh, an employee that I had invested in. And you, and you see this all the time where that's a good way to like pick up a new uh, employee is that other shops, they, they do cutbacks, and then all of a sudden it's time for them to grow. All the work is cutting in, coming in. They don't have anyone now. Um, so I just think if you're going to invest long term, like you have to just uh, try to get through it as in any way you can to keep these people because they, they a per, like a cutting back on a person who's been with your team for a long time and is just, you're losing so much value. I mean, they know your clients, they know your projects in and out, they know how you work, they know each other. Like, there's just too much value there. Like, uh, to me, like, each one of these people is worth to me millions of dollars. Like, I guess I overvalue them, but they, they seem, I wouldn't, you know, if I'm if I'm twenty thousand dollars short, I'm not getting rid of something that's worth millions of dollars. Um, okay, this has I think been interesting for us. So, a lot of the I think part of the reason that people can't find enough talent is they're looking at a very small part of the talent pool, right? So, and they will say, oh, oh well, I. I wish that we had more diversity at my company, but when we make a job posting, it's always the same types of people that apply pretty much, right? So what can we do, right? Well, there's a reason why people aren't applying to your job. And I th think I know what it is. Um, because when I was trying to, right before I started ZipTech, I was considering trying to work for one of the Drupal shops. And there was no way I was going to look at a bunch of random job postings and apply to them. Because if I did, my chances would be that I would interview there and then maybe get the job. And then I would find out it was a culture that I didn't enjoy because I was always fighting uphill. It was mostly guys. They, their communication style was like expecting me to have a thicker skin and a little bit hostile. It was just like 
kind of annoying to just deal with on a daily basis, just in a small way, but in a way that's just sort of like, you know, just taxes you. So I would have to look for jobs that specifically um, seemed like a better culture. So the places that I wanted to work were like the ones where they were already more diverse and already like were showing um, a positive friendly culture online. And those were the only ones that I was going to apply to. There was no way I was going to go work at some like programmer place, right? And so if I just saw a random job posting, the odds were that it probably wasn't going to be a good culture. So I wouldn't just apply to the random job postings. And so we, we've seen the same thing where we didn't get, we get mostly the same sort of types of people that apply for job postings. They're, they're confident uh, about their skills. They're usually men. They're usually white. They're usually straight. Um, they've usually been doing computers for a really long time. They're really obsessed with computers. So there's this is a very small like part of like the overall world that's actually willing to apply for our jobs. But now that we've, and, and for a long time we really weren't that diverse, even in terms of gender, um, despite me being the CTO, was still always mostly guys. But in the past couple years, we've got it to almost 50-50. And it wasn't even really like, we didn't make a huge effort or, or anything like that. It was more just like we, we like reached like a tipping point where we just had enough women that other women were coming to us. And they all of a sudden, they're begging us to work for us because they want to work in this industry. They just don't want to work at some of these places that are going to be like an unhealthy uh, emotional place for them to, to be. So they see that we have all these other women, the other women are speaking well of us, and now all of a sudden there's a much bigger talent pool. So those kinds of things make you realize like, oh, the talent pool is actually really large. We're just only seeing a part of it, right? There's lots of really intelligent people out in the world. They just don't all have the, ba the same background. So where we've been recruiting lately, um, there's like some boot camps in Philly. So we've actually gotten three people that graduated from this boot camp. It's not Drupal specific, but they come out of that and they have like, uh, you don't have to pay the boot camp anything. Um, but they have like good background because they've learned Git and you know CSS and JavaScript and stuff like that. So that's been working out because it, it's good to have them, you know, have just the basics done that they could get anywhere. We also hire people from meetups. We have like our local Drupal meetup. Um, another good place to hire from is is trainings. Uh, you can really see how someone learns when you train them. So you can take time to like do some some trainings and try to to uh, get people from there. But yeah, I have the same thing at meetups. Like if someone comes and they ask good questions and they and I have a good conversation with them. Um, then a lot of times we bring them in for an interview. We hire a lot of friends of employees. That's actually worked pretty well for us. Uh, so like we, I have a bunch of friends that work for me and I have some of our other people have brought in a bunch of their friends. The reason that that works um, is that a lot of times smart people have smart friends and also when you already have a friend, it's like someone's invested in making sure you succeed. So you already have like a champion and a mentor and, and that person will usually help you after work and, and make sure that you are really going to, to be a success. And colleges, um, I think it's good. There's lots, there's just so many college grads coming out that can't get good careers, even with master's degrees these days. Um, and I don't really, I'm not that concerned if they have a computer science degree. If they have a computer science degree, uh, they're going to want way more money and be a lot more like usually arrogant about their awesome computer science skills. 
We're software engineers, though. We're not computer scientists. We're not here trying to, like, you know, invent some new compression uh, algorithm like on Silicon Valley. We're just trying to, like, make websites here, you know? <laughs> it's really not a science. It, <laughs> it's engineering. And, they don't, and very few schools teach software engineering. They mostly all teach computer science, which is kind of crazy, but I guess they're just sort of behind the times. So how do you evaluate um, really green people if they don't really have the uh, technical things to evaluate? So I really like try to go for the soft skills because soft skills are hard to teach, but hard skills are easy to teach relatively. So soft skills are like, um, how honest are they? How open are they? How well do they communicate? Um, and these, these things, you'll have a really hard time changing someone away if they have problems like that. Um, but if they don't know how to use Vim, guess what? They can learn that. You know, I have no problem with them like learning all of these hard skills. So they end up with these great developers with all these great soft skills, which is amazing. So I like to look at the strengths outside of our field, their learning trajectory, like if they've started learning, like what can they tell me about what they've learned so far and how's it going? And, and so here's just like, I'll rush through this because I've been talking too long, but here's just some of my people that I'm proud of. So this is a friend of mine, Steve, who started in 2008 as an intern. He's a senior developer now and um, one of our top guys. He's been extremely valuable. He had no uh, computer background. Doesn't really care about tech that much, but he's awesome at it. <laughs> uh, this guy, Sean, he started as our designer in 2010. Now he's our creative director. He's, uh, our, he's a great uh, creative director, but he started with very little experience. He had some internship where he wasn't paid and then he got kicked out. When we hired him and like gave him a real job, he's like with us for life now. Super valuable guy. These are two people that we hired from our boot camp in 2014 that had uh, almost no background in the field. Uh, Allison now is like running a whole team for us um, that, that works for a pharmaceutical company. Jason is now um, a lead developer. He's also like running teams. They're great at like, they're, they're both uh, amazing. So I'm really glad we got them. These are some of our latest hires. They both came from a boot camp nearby and have very high hopes for them in the future. And this is just an example of, you know, that we move people up every part of the business. It's not just the development team. This is Christine. She's down working at our booth because she just changed from like our receptionist to being in marketing. So we're always trying to get people that are they have a lot of talent, put them in any position, let them learn the business, and then give them opportunities to see where they want to go. And that's, you know, they give us a lot for us giving them that. And then we have, you know, the thing is I always say about doing this is like the worst case scenario is still a pretty good scenario, okay? So the worst case scenario is that, is that the people leave. Um, but it's not, it's when they leave, it's like, there still are advocates, they're still working with us. Now that we have this product probo, a lot of these people are pushing it in their organizations. They're still our friends, so Aaron Couch was, these are just people who specifically had very little um, working experience when they started with us and who have gone on to have great careers. Um, this guy, Steven, he came in, um, as an unpaid intern because he didn't have papers. He was from Ireland and he, he just came to the office and he said, is it okay if I just like come in here every day and just work for you guys for free? I have no experience, but I want to do this. We're like, okay. Um, he uh, worked for Sony for, he has a whole career now. I mean, he's got a, a family. So it, it feels good even if they're not still with us to see um, how successful they've, they've been. So, Please uh, evaluate this. I have time for a couple questions. I go. Uh, you got to talk, talk to the mic. 
Uh, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, everybody in this room wants perfect, beautiful flowers in their people garden. What are some kind of red flags for you when when it's time to stop investing in a person? Yeah, um, we have definitely had to let some people go, but and it's always been really hard. Um, and there have definitely been times when I've wanted to let someone go, and then later on, over the years, they, they turn out to be awesome because they're just learning slower than I thought they could. Um, but I think it's mostly been when they don't have the, the soft skills there. I've never ever let someone go because they weren't a good enough developer. There's always something you can have them do. Um, like we have some people that, you know, it's not, maybe they're not a great developer, but then we have them doing operations work that they're great at. We can find something else that they're great at. The real reason they have to go is if their soft skills aren't there, like they just aren't communicating, they keep going into a rabbit hole and not coming out of it and blowing up the tickets, um, or like they, they're just, or they're not, they just never come to work on time, they're not taking it seriously, you just can't rely on them and they just keep on messing things up type of thing. But those are like more like soft skills, mostly. Um, yeah. I assume it takes time to grow these people. So if if you have someone who is really junior, approximately how much time do you think it takes them to grow into a, a role where they can do a project, a development project? Yeah, so she said, like, how long does it take to, to grow someone new until they can, like, really do a project? A long time. I mean, it, it, we usually have people billing after a few weeks, not full time, but they'll be billing a little bit, and then we'll be discounting some of it. Um, and then they can be like an active, um, useful person in a project, usually about like six months. Mm -hmm. But they're not, but they're not doing it on their own. Then they're still getting a lot of help. Um, and then usually it takes like a year or two before they're really competent. Mm -hmm. So it is a long haul. Yeah. So I've been doing that too, until I got to the point where I need someone quickly because we were doing so good, we were growing so fast. So it gets hard when you need to find. 50, 60 people in six months. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any ideas of how you can get some people quickly? Because we hired lots of people, and of course the new people may be good, but you know, uh, we, we don't get so much time to train them on all of these things from zero. So then they get to train other people. They train them in a different way, the way they're used to. Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, things. if you have to grow that fast, it's, it's <laughs> going to be a mess no matter what, I guess. I mean, that's really fast growth. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you definitely have to have a balance, but I, I think it's really just when you're that, when you have that many people coming in, you have to have more time for them to communicate. So they need to like be working together to make sure they're get, starting to get all on the same page, which is going to take extra time that they're not billing for. So it's just going to be rough. <laughs> so. Thank you. I really like your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks.